So welcome everybody. Thanks so much for joining. My name is Connor. Uh, I'm a, a Cisco systems engineer or solution architect. I'm, I'm here to talk to you about our experiences running Kubernetes clusters as network engineers, running these, these applications for uh, internal Cisco SEs. In terms of the applications that we're running, we have about 15 applications, 20 developers, give or take. Uh, we have some small ap applications, some large ones, but it is a best effort service, and we'll get to why that's important a little bit later on. These are all internal applications as well, so all internal meaning the sys they're used by the Cisco sales team, so the Cisco SEs around the world. To get right into what we've actually built. So we have three Kubernetes clusters. These have been built using the container platform and uh, InterSight Kubernetes service. What we have are a uh, production cluster. We have a management cluster that started out as a, a registry using Hava, and we also have a testing slash sandbox cluster. Now the InterSight Kubernetes service and, and container platform help you to build a, a, a a tenant cluster as a service, so to say. So that means that they stand up the cluster for you or the, the software stands up the cluster. It builds uh, the, the networking connectivity, builds all of the load balancing, and it also provides us with things like an Nginx ingress, which will be important in just a little while. On top of that, we also have integrated some of the Cisco monitoring. So for example, Cisco Thousand Eyes to show us the networking connectivity uh, we also have open source monitoring as well. So we'll have a look at some of that using Prometheus and Grafana. We have Harbor for our container registry. We use Keycloak for our authentication and we use Vault, HashiCorp Vault for our secrets. All of those run on our management cluster. We run a little bit of automation using GitLab CI CD and Terraform and primarily building these applications with uh, Python and Node.js. So that's what we've built. And let's have a look at a couple of the, the lessons that we've learned along the way while actually um, managing this project. So the first one is resource segmentation. This always comes up for any product where there is multi-tenancy capable. The question is, what is the best way that I should be running or, or configuring this this uh, this environment for my for my requirements, and that's going to depend on on every customer. Every customer may be different. From our perspective, what works well for us is we've decided to segment via the app name, and we tie an application name to a particular namespace within a Kubernetes cluster. So you might also have an application that spans multiple namespaces. You could have multiple applications. In a namespace, you could have one Kubernetes cluster per application. For what works best in our environment, we tie everything to the namespace, and that means that our, our namespace in Kubernetes controls all of the, the different resources for that particular um, application. For example, our, our pods, our deployments, our services, our ingress, our, our persistent volume claims. Uh, we also have the, the same kind of setup with all of the other components. So the registry, we have our, our own project per application for our vaults. Our setup, we have a secrets engine per app. For GitLab, we have a repo per app. And this is all tied together through Keycloak, which is our authentication. And we link that to a, a one, one Keycloak group per application. The way that we provide this access, which we found works the best for, for our way, is we have one role and we have one role binding per application within our, uh, our Kubernetes cluster. And so that role, in this case, you can see that the, the application name is EPAD and we have a group within Keycloak also called EPAD and the namespace for this particular role and role binding is EPAD. So it allows us to have that consistent deployment and consistent experience uh, when, when configuring these components. So one role, one role binding per application. The way that we keep this consistent and all of these different YAML files and the configuration consistent is through Terraform and a, a very, very simple Terraform module that we wrote. So it's for, for um, RBAC. 
all we have to do to, to add an application in this case is update our, our apps variable with the application name for our new application. And you can see there that that will automatically create a new role and a new role binding. For our role binding, we have there the, the app name used for the name, for the namespace, for the role reference, as well as for the subject. So it makes it very, very easy for us to, to roll out a, a new application. We simply add it to the Terraform com config. We update our key cloak to add a new group, and then we assign any developers to that uh, key cloak group who need access to the application. The next challenge or, or lesson that we learned was how we, we provide access to these clusters. Now, like I said, the, the container platform, uh, InnoSite Kubernetes service actually provides or, or out of the box rolls out a, a, an Nginx ingress. And because of limited IP address space, and we wanted to also centralize, um, terminate the, the TLS sessions on that ingress, we decided to, to utilize that also for our access. So all of our applications are actually configured, deployed behind that ingress controller. So for example, using the, the Kubernetes example, uh, the guest book application, we just want to show you one of the challenges that we ran into when actually provisioning the applications behind an ingress. So here we have our ingress controller and we have a path, so slash guest book. This is what it should look like when it's working. The way that this works is we request the resource, so the index.html page, and Nginx will look at that path, will redirect it to the front end service. That service then picks one of our front end pods, and that pod is uh, running Apache and it's serving from the root directory. When that works fine, it returns our index.html file. This is what you might see as an example for a, a Kubernetes ingress. So you can see there that we've got a path slash guestbook. We've got a, a service front end, which our, our pods are, are tracking our pods that are running Apache. And then we're going to rewrite from slash guestbook to just a forward slash. And because it's, it's listing on root, our Apache pod is listing on root. It then returns that, uh, that index.html. The challenge that we find with some applications like dashboards, things that have to load uh, different assets, so JavaScript or, or um, CSS files or images, is when we, we load that first index page and then we have to load an additional asset, such as a controllers.js. So in this case, what happens with that ingress is we reach the Nginx controller, we find the path and then we rewrite the path to forward slash. We strip off all of the guest books, strip off all of the controllers.js, and then we pass it through to Apache. And then that returns our default index.html file, as you can see there in that little screenshot down the bottom. That's not what we want, and that's not allowing our application to actually run or our dashboard, our guest book to run in this case. Now, there are a couple of ways that we found to overcome this. Uh, the first one is to update the ingress. And so we add a little bit of regex onto the end of our path. And so that first, we have two capture groups here. And a, a capture group is within the, the set of parentheses. So you can see there we have a capture group that matches the forward slash. And then we have a second capture group, so period and asterisk. And that matches all of the, the text or the string behind the second forward slash, so guestbook slash controllers.js. And by rewriting that and then using that dollar two, so referencing that second capture group, we're able to add on all of the uh, the additional text that might follow the, the application name, so guestbook in this example. So that's the first way that we can overcome this. The second way, and this is the one that, that I prefer, but both, um, both are adequate, is when you build your images, so you're building your Apache server here, what we can do is we can just simply add a, a new folder, create a new folder. In this case, it's called guestbook. We add all of our, our files into that guestbook folder, and we add that into our, um, our build script. And then we simply update the Apache 2 configuration or whatever web server you're working with. 
to reference that new folder. And so now we're changing the document root from that forward slash to our forward slash guest book slash whatever, whatever it is. And in that case, we don't actually need to change the ingress at all. We don't need to use any kind of regex or rewrite targets because we're simply passing on all of the guest book and the guest book slash controllers and anything else onto our Apache server. And it's going to understand what all of that, that means. So that's for building your or and running your web server, something like an application like WordPress. We found it's even easier. In this case, you don't need any special ingress. You can use the one that we saw before without the rewrites, without the regex. Uh, we don't need to update any Apache or any configuration. All we need to do in this image of WordPress is to add in a working directory into this deployment. And as you'll see in the logs for the container, when this image deploys, the installation script checks first if the working directory exists and if there are already files in there. And if there aren't, i.e. it's the first deployment, then it's going to copy all of those files into this new working directory. So that makes it very, very easy for us to go and deploy this and not have to worry about any kind of, of rewrites or regex to, to actually uh, get the and, and serve the, the content correctly. The next challenge we came across, uh, like many of our customers, we run proxies uh, within our environment, within our lab. And while our proxy settings were working correctly, so you can see there we have some environmental variables, HTTP underscore proxy uh, and no proxy. These were all working correctly for most of our, our applications. When we deployed our node applications. It took us a little while and a bit of troubleshooting. We discovered that we weren't actually, they, they weren't respecting the proxy settings that had been configured. And after a little bit of troubleshooting, we discovered this issue. It seems that some of the packages that, that we are using with our node application, so to make those requests out and to open up WebSockets to external services, the packages aren't actually respecting the, the environmental variables for that proxy setting. So in this case, we're able to use the global agent library or module. We reference that as part of the boots or the install script, and then we load that as we load our script as well. The other challenge that we came across uh, was with the no proxy. So if you're, you're new to Kubernetes, uh, you're starting to work with, with services, you might have a number of services for all the different components. For example, you might have a, a front end service to talk to your front end pods. You might have the database service or the API service. It's very, very important that you put any of the, the, the trap or any of the endpoints or the services that need to stay local to the cluster in the no proxy setting within your, uh, your deployment script. Otherwise, you might be like us where you will be getting a lot of redirects from your proxy. So we had a service that had our front end talking to an API service, and we kept getting these redirects saying, you don't need to go to API-service, you need to go to API-service.com, which in this case was not correct. And so it was only after we added that API-service into the no proxy setting that we're able to, uh, to overcome that. So any any communication that needs to, and any endpoints where communication needs to stay internal to the cluster and not go through the proxy, so bypass the proxy, need to be configured in that no proxy setting. The next point is on backups and persistent volumes. We use Cohesity within our environment, uh, along with Valero, to, to back up all of our Kubernetes clusters and all the, re, the namespaces and the resources within that and the persistent volumes. The issue that we came across was if we don't have a persistent volume, then there's nothing to, to back up. And this is the case with one of our, our databases. So we run database on Kubernetes. Um, we haven't had any issues at the moment or yet, uh, besides this one where a node went down, the pod was destroyed, the node came back up or we, we redeployed the pod and suddenly we, we had all of our data uh, was deleted, right? And that is the nature of Kubernetes and that it's stateless. If you want some kind of, of data to persist across the, the redeployment of a, a pod or a container, you need to have a persistent 
volume. And so you need to mount a volume. You need to first claim it. Uh, that persistent volume will then be written to some kind of physical storage such that when you deploy new new pods or you they're, they're destroyed and recreated, you still have access to that, that data that's written. In this case, it was lucky that we had uh, the developers actually backing up themselves as well, and they were able to restore from, from that backup. Which brings us on to a key point. Understand what is running in your environment, understand how it's, it's working. In this case, it would have been very, very helpful to know that this, this pod didn't actually have a persistent volume attached to it, um, which we were all expecting. There was a, a little bit of a mistake and we overlooked the configuration for that pod deployment. But it's very, very key that you have some kind of monitoring set up within your environment. We, we use Grafana here with Prometheus. We set up a very, um, very uh, simple, easy to, to read dashboard, just created it ourselves that looks at CPU memory. We can look at all the different pod states. We can look at the IP address states. We also have dashboards which look at the, the volume, so the persistent volume, so that we know when those are almost full, because we've also had in the past some issues where our, our login volumes filled up. We then had to go and uh, refresh those and expand them. Now, you don't need to build the dashboards themselves. For example, with Grafana, you can go and uh, just use the community provided dashboards. There are also dashboards, for example, that have been built for Nginx ingress controller if you wanted to see the traffic or another point for certification or for certificates for SSL certs. This was another issue that we had. We've been running a, a cluster now. We've just discovered we've been running it for a year. And the reason we were able to discover we'd been running it for a year was because our certs expired. And a lot of the cases when it's not a DNS issue, it's because someone has forgotten to renew a cert, and that's the reason that the, you know, that, that product or that solution or platform has gone down. This was exactly the same case for us. We didn't have any kind of monitoring that stage for this. Uh, we went and, and renewed them, so we did have a bit of downtime with that, that cluster. But the way that this is the container platform has been built is using Cube ADM to deploy it. And so we were able to run the Cube ADM, renew all um, command and a couple of other configurations to actually get that, that cluster back up and running. It's very, very important that you understand when your certs are going to expire, even if it's as simple as putting a 30, 60, 90 day calendar notification so that you get that pop up or that email that says you should go and renew the, the, the certs before everything breaks. What we also have for monitoring, so rather than just logging in, so we can set up alerts with, with Grafana, um, but also besides just logging in and, and having a look at the different dashboards that we have, we actually use the KubeWatch bot. It's our open source project. We run that on our cluster. We then send any of the notifications or the messages to a WebEx Teams bot that we run. And that WebEx Teams bot then puts that message in a, a WebEx room in which we're all, so all developers and all of the, the infrastructure engineers are a part of. And that gives us a very, very easy way, both on our laptops and on our phones and whatever other device we have WebEx, gives us a very, very easy and clean notification that something has been created or something has been deleted. So there's different ways to monitor, there's different pieces that, that you should be monitoring and looking at, uh, but it's very, very key to understand exactly how your cluster is, is running. We are um, best effort service for, you know, if, if, if we're on a customer call, we're on holidays, then it has to wait. If an application requires something more than a best effort service and around the clock support, then we have other services within Cisco uh, that Cisco IT manage that we can actually run those, those applications on. And it's going to be the same for anything that you run within your business. You have to look at what is the value that we get from building it, hosting it, running it ourselves. In our case, we get a lot of value just from learning, being able to, to um, look at what our customers and partners like yourselves would be going through. But then for some things that are critical, some applications, we then 
make the decision that it's best, best that someone else that a dedicated team can actually run those applications and, and support that infrastructure. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your time. Hope you enjoy the rest of DevNet Create and thanks and have a great day.